text for a minute. The question is, why would the Lord of Lords, the Savior of the world, the one who came to die for the sin of, uh, sins of the world, the one who made everybody, why would he say to his disciples when the disciples came to him and said the Pharisees are offended? Why would Jesus say, let them alone? Why would the king of kings say, have no conversation with them? Do not be concerned about them. Do not curry their favor or court their favor. Do not dread their displeasure with you. Both they and their followers are doomed. Why would Jesus I understand why you might say it, or I may say it, but Jesus, who loves everybody, who died for everybody, why would Jesus say, let them alone? Write these people off. Why would Jesus, the reasons for our Lord's harsh response, harsh but proper response, was where the Pharisees' faith was and their attitude. They had the nerve to come to Jesus and they asked Jesus a question. Verse 1 tells us that the scribes and the Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, these were the Jerusalem scribes and Pharisees. All right? They came to Jesus and they said to Jesus, with their arrogant uppity selves. Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. Why is it that your disciples go against the traditions of the elders? They transgress the traditions of the elders because they eat without washing their hands. The problem was, here's what the problem Jesus had, is that these scribes and Pharisees, they came to Jesus because they had a problem with Jesus' disciples, their nonconformity to a man-made tradition. They were not upset that Jesus' disciples had violated a biblical rule. Or that they had violated something Moses wrote. No, they were upset because they violated a man-made tradition. That was a man-made tradition. After the Babylonian exile, the Jewish rabbis began to make meticulous rules. Hear this and regulations governing the daily life of the people. They were, these were interpretations and applications of the law of Moses handed down from generation to generation. They were not the law of Moses. These were interpretations on the law of Moses. What was the tradition of the elders? Matthew Henry writes that the people should wash often their hands. And always at meal, this they place a great deal of religion in, supposing that the food they touched with unwashed hands would be, uh, would be defiling to them. The Pharisees practiced this themselves, and with a great deal of strictness imposed it upon others. Amen. What was the transgression of this tradition or this injunction by the disciples of Jesus. Apparently, Jesus' disciples, according to verse 2, 
uh, ate bread in the presence of the Pharisees without going through this ceremonial washing. The custom was innocent enough and had a decency uh, in its civil use. I mean, it had a good application because you ought to wash your hands before you eat. But when it began to be imposed as a religious requirement, that's when the problem came in. And even though the disciples were weak, they knew that that was not required of God. So in the presence of the Pharisees, knowing that they were going to set them off, they ate their food without going through this ceremonial washing. They were probably hungry. Because the way the washing worked was, before the meal, here's, how, here's how, what you had to do. You had to, uh, the, the, there were several washings. Good Jews were expected to perform the miracle of washing before, during, and after each meal. Bear with me. A person would pour water on his hands with his fingers pointing up with the water reaching its wrists. Then he would turn the fingers down and pour the water on his hands and let the water drip off of his fingers. If you mixed up the order, you were still unclean. So if your hands were up when they should have been down, you were wrong. They were down when they should have been up. You were wrong. And then you had, after washing them, you had to rub your hands together. But if you got the process wrong, so first one, fingers up. Second one, fingers down. Then rub your hands together. So if you make a mistake, fingers down, then fingers up and rub your hands together. Still unclean. If you rub your hands together and you hadn't washed them fingers up or fingers, fingers down, unclean. And I mean, it was a, a, a ridiculous thing, but that, that's what happened when man take over. So, so the violation was that these men were disobeying the tradition of the elders. Praise the Lord. So Jesus asked them a question. He said, verse 3, but Jesus answered and says, why do you also violate the transgression, the tradition of God, the scriptures, by your traditions? You see, they put the tradition of the elders on a higher par than the scriptures. He said, now, what you are questioning me about with regard to my disciples, my disciples have violated have not violated the word of God at all. It was never written in the law of Moses that you had to wash your hands this way, that way, then rub them together. It's not in Moses' law. You did that. And you're concerned that they wouldn't participate with that. But there are things in Moses' law, in the law, that I told you not to do. And you violate that. And we have no problem with that. Just like in church today. The same person who will kill you for missing your report will look the other way when you're immoral. But you just got to pay your report. Same people who will let you sing if you're talented. Look the other way with that. But let other things get away. That's the way man, man is. That's what Jesus was up against. So what he did was, are you, are, you, are you hanging in there with me? He gave an example of how they valued human tradition over the scripture. He says in verse 4 and 5, God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and thy mother. And he that curses father and mother, let him die the death. That's Exodus chapter 20 and verse 12. But you say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, it is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me and honor not his father and his mother shall be free. 
Thus you have made the commandment of God of none effect. What's going on here? The Jewish law as well as the Old Te New Testament teaches that children ought to care for their aging parents. But there were kids who got tired of caring for their parents. So what they did was they found a slick way to keep from taking care of mom and dad. If you read uh, Mark and uh, Luke's account, you will read where they, they use words, that the name of it was the vow of Corbin. They would take the money that they had heretofore used to help their aging parents and would take that money, and the money was not a tithe. It was not an offering. They, they just didn't want to help their parents anymore, and they would declare the money Corbin, which meant the money was now dedicated to the temple. So mom and dad, you didn't have to take the money and help them because the money was dedicated to the temple. So they took this wicked uh, tradition, and the, the kids were neglecting their aging parents and putting the money in the temple, and the priests and the Pharisees gave their blessings to this wicked tradition. Jesus says, in doing that, you made the word of God of none effect. Said, your, praise the Lord, traditions have made the scriptures of none effect, and you have the nerve to come to me and ask me why did my disciples not participate in your man-made traditions? Jesus looked at them in verse 7 and called them hypocrites. He said, you hypocrites. Why were they hypocrites? Because they had violated God's law. But they were upset that, that Jesus' disciples violated their law. And any way you look at it, the law of God is stronger than the law of man. Jesus says, you hypocrites, Isaiah did write about you, saying this people draw nigh to me with their mouths and with the, they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrine, the traditions, the commandments of men. I want you to know it's vain worship when we worship God according to the whims of our mind and not according to what is written in the scripture. Praise the Lord. And now look at this. And then Jesus called the multitude together and explained to them, it's not that which goeth in a man that defiles the man, but it's what comes out of the man. Otherwise, if you eat without washing your hands through this purification, that's not going to defile you. It's what comes out of your mouth. That's what tells you of the true condition of your heart. Now, I'll tell you what should have happened. That it's the Pharisees. That's right, Rocky. You call Rocky. We give up room dead on me today. Call Rocky. The, the Pharisees. Oh, I, I know you're listening. I, I enjoy talking to you. The Pharisees should have repented. The Pharisees should have said, I got found in the word. Ooh, he got us today. Pharisees should have said, my toes are hurting. Well, Jesus have stepped on my toes. The word got me. The Pharisees over in the amen corner, all you should have heard was, ouch. Ooh. Woo. But because the, the word is right. But instead, they got offended. Preach with them. They got angry. How dare he say that? Who do he think he is? How dare he? The, the Greek word is scandalon, that which leads to ruin. Let me tell you, if the word of God condemns what you do, and if, and if God's truth makes what you do uh, lead, cause you to end up in ruin, you need to quit what you're doing. So, amen. Get, get off that train. Get off the train. Don't, don't get mad with the word. Get off the train. You're headed the wrong way. You see, that the word would offend you, that's one thing. But you can't stay offended too long. Because if you stay offended with God's word too long, you've crossed over from being offended, good God, to, praise the Lord, rebellion. 
I'm mad, I'm mad, I'm not going to say amen. I'm not going to get with it. All right, stay right there. Pharisee, that's what they did. After Jesus, notice this, after Jesus told them off, he switched his attention from them in verse 10, and he spoke to the multitude. He said, forget them. Multitude, let me explain. Eating without your hands being ceremonially washed will not condemn you. It's what comes out of your mouth. That's what tells what shape you're in. So now here the Pharisees over here told off and they should have been repenting and thanking Jesus for telling the truth. Instead, they were upset with him. So Jesus' disciples came to him and said, do you not know that the Pharisees have been offended? Lord Jesus, they displayed the wrong emotion. Saints, your emotions are yours. I told them in the 8 o'clock class today, but you got, to learn how to, you got to learn how to question your emotions. You got to ask yourself, do I have a right to be offended? What the preacher said made me mad. But just because you're upset, you got to ask yourself, should I be? Amen. Do I? Well, I feel the way that I feel. Yes, but you got to challenge that. Because sometimes you can feel like you were, uh, praise the Lord, told the wrong thing. When in fact, you were told the right thing. Thank you, Jesus. This is why you, the Bible teaches that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Well, I felt some kind of way about it. Forget that. Challenge that some kind of way. Because if it's God's truth, God's truth will forever stand. God's truth will be right all the time. And when you go against the truth of God, you get in trouble with God. Jesus knew that they were offended. Jesus knew that they were mad. Jesus knew that they were angry. And he didn't even try to fix it. He didn't go back to them and give them a lollipop. He didn't try to placate them. He was just done. They're going to be lost. And then the disciples came to him and said, Lord, do you not know that they've been offended? Jesus looked at the disciples and said, let me teach you a lesson. Every plant that my heavenly father hath not planted shall be rooted up. There is a difference between what God permits and what God plants. Oh Lord, the Lord is uh, obligated to take care of what he plants. But God has no obligation to what he permits. You know, people talk a whole lot about God's permissive will. But I've never read anywhere in the Bible where that is so. See, because the problem with being in God's what we call permissive will is where does being in his permissive will end and disobedience begin? Why does being in his permissive will end and rebellion begins? said the Lord he didn't want me to do it but he permitted me so it, he, he wasn't for it but he let me do it anyhow well how, how, how on earth does something God is not for become God's will he, 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 think about it he can't be against it and then it turns around and be his will at the same time the Bible talk about the good perfect an acceptable will of God. I've read about that will, but this other stuff, sometimes what it is is we want to do what we want to do. We want to live like we want to live, and then we want to cloak it up in religion and say God permitted me to do it. There's a word for that. It's called disobedience. And the Lord is calling every one of us to come out of that stuff. Hallelujah. He didn't, prom he permitted the Pharisees, but he wasn't in it. And he brought them deliverance from it and they didn't take him up on it. And I'm here to say a lot of this stuff, it's not the Lord's doing, but it is the Lord's permitting. But if you want to be held up, you don't want to be a part of what God has permitted. 
you want to be a part of what God has planted because when Jesus plants a thing Jesus waters that thing Jesus cultivates it Jesus blesses it I want to be found planted in Jesus not just doing things that God permits because grace will soon run out good God Almighty the Bible said be sure that your sins will find you out and if there's anybody here today that's doing something that you know God's not pleased with don't stay in that thing that he's permitting come on and get in that which God has planted because when you get in what God plants there are blessings over there when you get in what God plants he'll keep you every time somebody tell God thank you I want to be rooted grounded and settled in the word because that's joy in the word of God that's power in the word of God somebody say yes what God plants God will protect but what God permits it has a short chef life it won't live but so long because he's not obligated you remember when the disciples started the, the, the Jerusalem church began to grow and the people were trying to stop the church and a wise man Gamaliel said and now I say unto you refrain from these men and let them alone for if this council praise the Lord for this if this council or this work be of God hallelujah if it's not of God it will come to naught but if it is of God you can't overthrow it because you'll be fighting against God if it's not of God it'll go out of business but if it is of God you can't put it out of business if you're standing on the word Jesus will hold you up the rains will come the devil will attack you but I'm here to say that the Lord will make a way somehow. Won't he do it? How many know that he's a way maker? How many know that holiness is still right? I wonder today, is there anybody here who will take the Lord's, the Lord's admonishing and tell the devil, I'm leaving you alone. I'm leaving you alone. I'm not having another conversation about this mess, Satan. The Lord rebuke you. I'm not going to court your favor, devil. I don't care if every devil in hell is mad at me because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And I'm here to tell you that whatever you give up for Jesus Christ. The Bible said, no man having left mother, father, sister, brother, homes, fortune, good God Almighty, for my name's sake, the Lord said, they will receive a hundredfold reward in this life and in the world to come life everlasting help me out brother in the world to come see somebody lift your hands and tell the lord thank you in the world to come life everlasting whatever you give up the lord will take up the Lord will bless you for. Y'all need to keep your eyes on me. Distract me when I got to ask you for help. Have you good God Almighty? Whatever you give up, the Lord will. He'll take up. He'll keep you every time. Oh, yes, He will. He's a keeper. I'm challenging somebody to tell the world goodbye. I'm challenging somebody to thank you, Jesus, to say, I'm not going with the devil but I'm going all the way with Jesus Christ. The church used to believe that if you had to deny Jesus, if you had to put Jesus on the back burner, that you wouldn't do it. 
good God Almighty. Some of you didn't change now, but the Bible is still right. I can hear Sister Mose. I can hear the late Daisy Burgess. They used to stand up with that singing group and sing a song that says, I'll take Jesus for mine. You can have the whole wide world, but I'll take Jesus for mine. Oh, is there anybody I want to witness here who will tell the world, I don't want what you have to offer. I don't want what you have to give because I already have somebody on the inside. I've already been washed and I've already been cleansed. I've already been filled with the Holy Ghost. I remember when I was in college, good God Almighty, they made the football players simulate having sexual relations with a tin can. They put the can on the floor and the football players had to get down in the front leaning rest position and, and do push-ups like they were having sex with a tin can. I was between the age of 17 and 18 and then it was my turn. Good God Almighty, all them big players standing around me, I told them I can't do it. I told them I won't do it. They told me this is tradition. They told me we've done this for years. They told me everybody's done it. I told them I'm a church of God and Christ preacher and I'm not gonna do it. Ah! 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 Somebody help me. Say yeah! Yeah! Thank you, Jesus. They looked at me. They said, preach. Who do you think you are? I hadn't been ordained yet. Sister Bull, I was just a minister. I said, I'm a minister in the church of God in Christ. And in holiness, we don't do stuff like that. And they looked at me, and I looked at them, and they looked at me, and I looked at them. And then they said, preacher, go to your room, close the door, and don't come out until we tell you. Guess what I did? I went to my room. Thank you for watching God First with Bishop Patrick L. Wooden Sr. and the Upper Room Church of God in Christ. To experience this message in its entirety, call 877-463-3477 to purchase a DVD or CD. God First will return next week at the same time. Until then, make every day a God First day. God First.